Hello. This is an audio recording of the Bible, the Big Picture, written by Lori and John Verstegen of Berean Bible Ministries in San Juan Capistrano, California. This book was written with the hope that it will help Christians better understand and enjoy the Bible, for it is through the written Word of God that we come to truly know and love the living Word of God. Nothing is more blessed than to more fully know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all the many blessings that are ours in Him. As you listen, we pray that you will be like the noble Bereans, who received the Word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. Luke wrote that in the book of Acts, chapter 17, and that was verse 11 for your reference. As you listen with us, ask yourself, For what saith the Scripture? And look up each verse referenced for you. You'll be amazed at how wonderfully the verses in the Bible, like pieces of a puzzle, fit together to reveal God's marvelous twofold plan and purpose for the heaven and the earth in Christ Jesus. Remember, Scripture alone is our final authority and source of truth. It is the Word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The Apostle Paul wrote that in 1 Thessalonians, chapter 2, that was verse 13. Please do also note that all verses used in this book are from the King James Version of the Bible. We strongly urge you to use the King James Version when searching the Scriptures, as the modern versions have made many changes to the text. If you would like a simple brochure comparing the translations, please visit our website at www.helpersofyourjoy.com. At the conclusion of this presentation, I'll have more to say about how to contact Berean Bible Ministries. Now, as we go through the Holy Scripture of God's Word, we'll be starting at the very beginning of things, in the book of Genesis, and following generally the sequence of the Bible's books in the order they appear in print. We'll begin with a brief introduction on the subject of salvation and learn the reasons for the pitiful conditions on this earth and the plans God has to restore righteousness. Then we'll begin the major topics of this presentation, starting with the books of the Old Testament, those that reveal God's plan to redeem the earth, and this is the subject of prophecy. Then we'll move into the Gospels in the earthly ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. This is where the prophecies begin to be fulfilled, as well as the covenants and promises that God had made with His people, the nation Israel. Our third major topic area will be an unprophesied change in plans. God interrupts Israel's prophetic program, and we'll learn why, through the writings of the Apostle Paul. Paul also announces the dispensation of God's grace, an entirely new plan of salvation for the world that was kept secret until now, and we'll find out why. And finally, our fourth major topic sees the resumption of Israel's stalled program and the carrying out of all of the remaining prophecies for Israel before she finally receives the promised kingdom on earth. It's exciting and informative, and I'm very happy you've chosen to join me here today. The Bible is God's eternal inspired word. Psalm 119 and Daniel chapter 10 teach that it was settled in heaven before it was ever written on earth. An angel told Daniel that he would show him that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And Daniel recorded everything that the angel told him. And those words became a part of the Bible. They actually became chapter 11 of the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 11 was already written in heaven before Daniel ever wrote it down on earth. God's word guides all that God does. By it, the worlds were framed, as the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 11, verse 3, and in it is God's offer of eternal life to those who will believe it. God's word is his revelation to us of himself. We know God through His Word. The central person of the Bible is the Lord Jesus Christ, the living Word of God, and He is pictured in some way in every one of its books. Hebrews 10.7 says, In the volume of the book it is written of me, 
And those are Christ's words. He is the seed of the woman, the great high priest, the Passover lamb, the kinsman redeemer, the rock of salvation, the chief cornerstone, the seed of David, the great I am, the son of God, the head of the church, and so much more. Jesus Christ is also rightfully the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords of all things, both in heaven and on earth. The Apostle Paul wrote that in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, and again in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. However, since Lucifer's fall, there has been a rebellion in both realms of God's kingdom. The Bible reveals God's twofold plan to end that rebellion, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Through Israel, the nation God created and will one day redeem, He will reclaim the earth. Through the body of Christ, the church He is currently creating, He will reclaim the heavenly places. Thus, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he will gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. This is a direct quotation from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, for your reference. And this is the eternal purpose and the twofold plan of God revealed in the Bible. The Bible, the big picture, was written to help you see how and where we fit into the outworking of this plan. Seeing how and where we fit in is vital because while all the Bible is for us, it is not all to us, nor is it all about us. Now, we cannot open the Bible and apply any and all verses to ourselves. For example, many passages command animal sacrifices. Obviously, no true Christian would teach that we should offer animal sacrifices today. We must distinguish between verses that apply today and verses that do not. We must rightly divide the word of truth, as the Apostle Paul advises in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, which says this, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Understanding the big picture and God's twofold plan will help to do this. Now, in no other area is rightly dividing more important than it is in understanding how to be saved from hell and stand completely forgiven and justified before a holy God. From cover to cover, the Bible teaches that salvation is by faith in God's word, for without faith it is impossible to please him. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, as Paul wrote to the Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. Saving faith is always a positive response to God's revealed word. However, God's revealed word has not always been the same in every age. So it is imperative that we know what his word is to us. The shed blood of Christ is the payment for the sins of all men of all ages. No one in any age could ever be saved except by the shed blood of Christ. However, in time past, prior to the cross, people did not know this. God had not yet revealed it. So their faith had to be placed in God's revealed word to them at that time. When it was revealed, God looked ahead to the cross in order to forgive their sins. According to Hebrews 11, it was by faith that Abel offered a sacrifice. Noah prepared an ark. Abraham left his land and offered up Isaac, and Moses forsook Egypt. To Israel, God gave his law. Clearly, Israelites could not have had true faith in God and at the same time refused to offer the sacrifices commanded in the law. Now, the sacrifices did not save them, but they were the evidence of their faith in God's revealed word to them at the time. In time past, then, faith was manifest by works. 
Today, though, God's Word tells us that we are not under the law, but under grace. Read that in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. God has revealed to us who live after the cross that Christ has done all the work necessary to save us. He shed His blood as the full payment for all of our sins, died, and rose again as proof that God has accepted that payment. Read this in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 28, and in Romans chapter 4, verse 25. Today, God tells us to stop working for salvation and trust instead in the work of His Son for our justification. Once again, Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 4, verse 5, these words, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. True faith today, then, will be manifest by resting in the shed blood of Christ, and that alone for justification. Adding works of any kind, like water baptism, committing your life to Christ, walking an aisle, keeping the law or repeated confession of sins, any of those, to the work of Christ in order to obtain forgiveness or salvation, is a denial that His work is enough. It is not faith in God's good news in this age of grace. So what about the future? Now, this age of grace will not last forever. One day, the church, the body of Christ, will be taken home to heaven, and God will have another message for the world, one that will again require works such as not taking the mark of the beast. Read that in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 12. And this will be much clearer after hearing the Bible, the big picture. The Bible begins by telling us that God created the heaven and the earth. Note that throughout the Bible, these two realms are distinct. When speaking of creation, God does not use the word universe, but instead specifies the heaven and the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says this, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We learn that God created all things in heaven and on earth by and for His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the all things include thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. Jesus Christ was and is to be the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords over all creation, both in heaven and earth. This statement is amplified frequently by the Apostle Paul and we can read this teaching in his epistles. On your own, we encourage you to study 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, and Colossians chapter 1. Look at verses 16 through 20. Even in the eternal state, the distinction between heaven and earth will remain in a new heaven and a new earth. You'll find a great amount of detail on this subject in Revelation chapter 21, also in Isaiah 65 and 2 Peter chapter 3. However, one of God's creatures did not like God's plan. His name was Lucifer, and he was the anointed cherub that covereth. He was created to lead the angelic host in song and praise to God. He was covered with beautiful stones that reflected the glory of God throughout the heavens. The Lord Himself gave these details to the prophet Ezekiel, and they are found in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 28. Take a look at verses 13 and 14. His position was higher than any other created being, but He was not satisfied. He wanted to be like the Most High. In the book of Isaiah the prophet, we read the words of the Lord Himself, speaking to the prophet. Hear what the Lord said about Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll read verses 12 to 15. These are the words of the Lord. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Genesis chapter 14, verse 19 and verse 22 define the title, The Most High God, as the title that speaks of God being the possessor of heaven and earth. Satan wanted to possess heaven and earth. His pride caused his fall, and he became Satan the devil. Now, since his fall, Satan's plan has been to take control of all creation. He led a rebellion in heaven, and many angels followed him. Read this in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. God says the heavens are unclean in his sight. You can read that in Job chapter 15, verse 15. In fact, God originally prepared hell for these fallen angels. Matthew records that statement in chapter 25, verse 41. Now, since God knew beforehand that Lucifer would rebel, he had a plan to one day cleanse the heavens and restore them to the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, he kept his plan to do so secret, so that Satan and his princes would not know it. God did not reveal his plan to restore the heavenly places anywhere in the Old Testament, so we will not discover it until much later in the Bible. The Apostle Paul writes of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 7 and verse 8. Also, the epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. For now, just remember that God did have a plan to regain complete control of the heavenly places, but he would only make it known in due time. When God created Adam and Eve, he instructed them to have dominion over the earth. Satan sought to continue his rebellion there. Now well, God had given Adam one simple command. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Satan the serpent questioned God's word by asking, Yea, hath God said? Then he challenged God's word by lying. Ye shall not surely die. Those are both Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and 4. Instead of trusting God's word, Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. Thus they brought sin and death into the world, and the earth was placed under a curse. Because of this, Satan was able to take dominion of the earth away from Adam. But this did not take God by surprise either. Just as God had a plan to take back the heavens, he had a plan to take back the earth. And he did begin to reveal his plan for the earth little by little, right from the very beginning of the world. This is what we read about in the Old Testament. And it brings us to what we would call key point number one. Throughout this presentation, we'll be highlighting things that we have just talked about, kind of a summary statement. You don't need to memorize these, but please bear in mind that these are key points, and we'll enumerate them for you as we go through the presentation. Key point number one, the Old Testament covenants and prophecies reveal God's eternal plans for the earth. May I repeat that? The Old Testament covenants and prophecies reveal God's eternal plans for the earth. Okay, there's the background we need. So now let's begin the first of the major topics that I told you we'd be looking at. The Old Testament and God's plans to redeem the earth, the subject of prophecy. At the fall of man, God told the serpent, Satan, that his seed would bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. But her seed, meaning a man, not an angel, would eventually bruise his head. We now know from further revelation in God's word that the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ, who will one day destroy Satan. But Jesus Christ did not come right away. God let men multiply on the earth, and as they did... Satan and his angels attempted to contaminate the human race in order to prevent the pure seed of the woman from coming. This is Genesis chapter 6. By Genesis 6, Satan had infected the human race so completely that only one man was perfect in his generations. 
So God sent a flood to destroy all of mankind except for Noah and his family. From Noah's family, the earth was repopulated, and the promised seed of the woman would eventually be born. Read about this in Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse 9, and Genesis chapter 9, verse 19. As men multiplied on the earth again, they soon became captive to Satan's idolatry and rebellion. Well, God had told them to spread over all the earth. Instead, they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11, verse 4. So God confused their languages, and the earth became divided into nations. God gave them up, and gave them over to a reprobate mind. Read Romans chapter 1. Concentrate on verses 24, 26, and 28. At this point, God revealed a little more about his plan to regain the earth. He would make his own special nation from a man named Abram later became Abraham. He would use this nation to bless all other nations. His nation would dwell in a special land, Canaan. He told Abraham the borders of the great kingdom his seed would have one day on the earth. And those borders are outlined in Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. This is the Abrahamic covenant. It's key point number two. We ask you to remember this part of the covenant especially. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee. And make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The Abrahamic covenant can be found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 13. God had promised to make a great nation from Abraham's seed. But Abraham and his wife Sarah did not have any children. They were getting older and older, and eventually they were too old to have children. This is when God gave them a miracle child, Isaac. The Abrahamic covenant was passed to him, and then to his son Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel, which means Prince of God. Israel had twelve sons, and they became the twelve tribes of Israel. The Abrahamic covenant was passed to them. This is outlined in detail for you in Psalm 105, verses 8 to 11. And it goes like this. He hath remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac and confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. From this point forward, God's nation would be named Israel. People of all other nations were called Gentiles. God made a difference between Israel and the Gentiles and erected what he called the middle wall of partition between them. You can read about this in Leviticus chapter 20, verses 24 through 26. When God spoke, he spoke to and through Israel. They were to be his channel of blessing to the world. This is key point number three. Israel was to be his channel of blessing to the whole world. God told Abram, later called Abraham, that his seed would be strangers in a land that was not their own. They would be afflicted there for 400 years, and afterwards God would deliver them out of bondage. And this is indeed what happened. The sons of Jacob, later called Israel, became slaves in Egypt. But just as God had promised, after 400 years, he sent a deliverer, Moses, to take his people out of Egypt to their promised land. Through Moses, God worked many great signs and wonders that proved that the earth belonged to him and that the children of Israel were his people. 
God defeated the gods of the Egyptians. Read this in Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. He destroyed Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea, and he brought Israel safely out of Egypt. He said that Israel would be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. That's Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. God's people had gone down to Egypt as a small family, but by the time they exited Egypt, they were over a million in number. Their passage through the Red Sea out of Egypt was their birth as a nation. God called them his son and his firstborn. Read this in Numbers chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. And when Israel left Egypt, God was with them. He said, Ye have seen how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. In the wilderness he miraculously provided for all of their needs. He sent manna, bread from heaven, quail and water. Their clothes and their shoes did not wear out. God was with them every step of the way. Yet the people constantly murmured and lost trust in God. Because of this, it took forty years for them to enter into their promised land. The generation of those who doubted God had to die before the rest could enter in. Read about this in the book of Numbers, chapter 14. Find details in verses 22 and 23, and from 28 to 35. Through Moses, God gave the people of Israel his law, statutes, and judgments. The purpose of this was to set them apart from all other people. They were supposed to be a light and an example to the rest of the nations. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Brings us to key point number 4 now, the Mosaic Covenant, or the covenant God made with Moses. Under the law, God said that if Israel obeyed, he would bless them in their land, and make them a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. However, if they disobeyed, God would curse them. He would take them out of their land and scatter them among the nations. That's key point four, the Mosaic Covenant. Because all men are sinful, no one, not even God's people, could keep the law perfectly. So God gave them a means whereby they could maintain their relationship with him. He instructed them to offer animal sacrifices as an atonement for their sins. When they believed God and offered a sacrifice by faith, the blood of the animals covered their sins. This is in Leviticus chapter 1. Though they did not know it at the time, these sacrifices were a picture of the coming sacrifice of Christ that God looked forward to. The sacrifice that would completely take away their sins forever. Under the law, God also gave Israel feast days to observe. Three times a year, all Israelite men were to go before the Lord to keep these feasts. Read about this in Exodus chapter 23. The three feasts of unleavened bread, with Passover and first fruits, the feast of harvest, which is also called Pentecost, was fifty days after first fruits, and the feast of ingathering. These feasts picture how God will eventually redeem his people and bring them into the promised land eternally. They picture real events that we'll read about later. The crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, Pentecost, the gathering of the faithful of Israel, the second coming of Christ, and the establishment of the kingdom on earth. When Israel first entered their promised land, they went through periods of obedience and disobedience. Eventually, though, a great king arose who served God, and his name was David. Under David, Israel had a mighty kingdom, and God made a special promise to him. To David, God revealed a little more about his plan to regain the earth. He promised that one day, David's seed, who will also be God's son, will sit on David's throne in Jerusalem and rule over Israel forever. Once this happens, Israel will dwell in the land promised to Abraham forever, and God's kingdom will be established on the earth forever. 
Read about this in Second Samuel chapter 7, verses 10 to 17. It is important to recognize that the kingdom described in the Davidic covenant is a literal, physical kingdom to be established upon the earth, just like David's kingdom was. So the Davidic covenant is key point number five for you this morning. A king from the seed of David, who will also be God's son, will rule over Israel from Jerusalem forever. When he does, the people of Israel will dwell in their own land in peace and safety forever. The Davidic Covenant, key point number five. David's son Solomon ruled next. His kingdom was a magnificent kingdom, and at the height of its glory it was a picture and type of the kingdom reign of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The entire world heard of its glory, and kings and queens came to see it and to honor Solomon. For most of Solomon's reign, he served God. However, in his later years, he took many wives who led him into idolatry. Because of this, Israel's kingdom was split into two parts, Israel consisting of ten tribes and Judah consisting of two tribes. Then every king in Israel, the northern kingdom, is also later called Samaria, led the people into idolatry. So as God had warned under the law, he took them out of the land by letting the Assyrians conquer them and carry them away. Read about this in Second Kings chapter 17. Later, Judah, the southern kingdom, also went into idolatry and was taken out of their land by the Babylonians. Second Kings chapter 24. The people of Israel were now scattered among the Gentiles, out of their land. This was God's judgment upon them for their continual disobedience. It is exactly what he told them he would do if they did not obey his laws. I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw a sword out after you, and your land shall be desolate. That's Leviticus chapter 26, verses 39, 33 to 39. Israel had failed under the Mosaic Covenant, but God would not forget his promises to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, which were not dependent on Israel's obedience. These are called unconditional covenants. Through the prophets, God revealed that he would one day make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Under the new covenant, God will do in them what they could not do on their own. He said, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. He promised, A new heart also will I give you, Israel, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 22 to 28, a lot of details, and Ezekiel chapter 37. God will one day gather Israelites from everywhere he has scattered them and bring them back into their promised land, where they will dwell forever. David's son, who will also be God's son, will be king over them and rule from Jerusalem in a kingdom of perfect righteousness. Read about this in Jeremiah chapter 33. Verses 15 to 17. Brings us to key point number six, a new covenant. God will do in Israel what they could not do for themselves. He will put his law in their hearts and cause them to do his will. Hence, Israel will one day be the light of the Gentiles that God intended them to be, a kingdom of priests. They will bring God's salvation to the world. The New Covenant, key point number six, is outlined in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 69, Isaiah chapter 60, verses 3 to 5, and Zechariah chapter 8, verse 2 to 3. The prophets confirmed the promises to the, of the New Covenant, gave more details about God's plan to restore the earth to Christ's rule. For example, God will send his son to save his people, Israel, from their enemies and their sins. 
Zacharias summarizes what the prophets had uh, said in Luke chapter 1, 10 verses, 67 through 77. He will conquer Satan and free his people in his land of him, Isaiah chapter 49. But he will first suffer and be cut off for the sins of his people, Israel, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 6 to 12. God's son, the seed of David, will set up his kingdom and rule the earth in Jerusalem forever. Isaiah chapter 24. The curse will be removed from the earth. Isaiah chapter 11 and uh, chapter 35. There will be a great healing of the people. Isaiah 35. During the kingdom, the people of Israel will be gathered into their land where they will be a kingdom of priests and a light to the Gentiles. Nations who want to be blessed will seek God in Jerusalem and will bless Israel. This would be a fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. However, before the kingdom is established, God will purge Israel during a time of chastening called the time of Jacob's trouble. Read about this in Jeremiah chapter 30, that would be verse 7. It's more commonly known as the tribulation period. He will destroy the rebels from among Israel so that only true believers, the little flock, or the elect, or the righteous, or the remnant, will be able to enter into the kingdom. You can read about this in Malachi chapter 3. The prophet Daniel gave a time schedule of the events that will occur prior to the establishment of God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. He prophesied that 69 weeks of years which converts to 483 actual calendar years, 69 weeks of years after the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah would come. This is Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. So once this event happened, those who believed God's word could count the years until the Messiah would come. According to Sir Robert Anderson, 483 years after the commandment was given, is the very day that Christ rode into Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. If you would like more detail on this, Sir Robert Anderson wrote a classic book called The Coming Prince, and it's available online and at uh, bookstores. Daniel had been taken to Babylon when King Nebuchadnezzar's army invaded Judah. The king had a dream that Daniel interpreted. The dream revealed that, beginning with the Babylonian Empire, Gentile kingdoms would rule over Israel until the Messiah establishes God's kingdom on earth. This era of Gentile domination is called the times of the Gentiles. Now, after the last Old Testament prophet wrote, God would not speak again until he would send the prophet to announce the arrival of the Messiah. The prophet Amos wrote, chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, these words. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The last book of the Old Testament is the prophet Malachi, the last of the so-called minor prophets. The interval between Malachi and the first book of the New Testament Matthew's uh, account of Christ's earthly ministry is roughly 400 years in duration. So now we move into the second major topic of our presentation, the Gospel period. Covenants and prophecies begin to be fulfilled. As we just mentioned, God was silent for approximately 400 years. Then, right on time, Messiah was born. It is significant that Matthew begins by telling us that Jesus Christ is the son of David, the son of Abraham, because Jesus Christ came to fulfill the Davidic and Abrahamic covenants. Remember, in these covenants, God promised to make of Abraham's seed a great nation, Israel, through whom God would bless the world. That nation was to be given a king of the seed of David who will rule over Israel from Jerusalem forever. In that kingdom, Israel will dwell in her own land in peace and safety forever, ministering to the Gentiles. 
that the birth of John the Baptist, Zacharias, his father, reaffirmed these promises when he prophesied that his son would prepare the way of the Lord. Please read Luke chapter 1, verses 67 through 79 very carefully in your own time. Now when the appointed time arrived, God broke his silence by sending John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. He was to announce the arrival of the Messiah and the at-hand phase of the kingdom of God. Now John is called the greatest prophet because, as Christ stated, the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. This is Luke chapter 16, verse 16. And it brings us to key point number 7. The law and the prophets before John had proclaimed that the kingdom was coming. But with the arrival of the Messiah, John was sent to announce that the kingdom was at hand. As prophesied, God sent his messenger, the forerunner John, to announce to Israel, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That is called the kingdom of heaven because it is heavenly in nature. Clearly, it is the kingdom promised to Israel in the Old Testament. The God of heaven will establish it upon the earth. Reference Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Also Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 21. They call it the days of heaven upon the earth. At that time, Israel spiritually was ruled by the religious traditions of the scribes and the Pharisees who were Satan's pawns. Satan had also filled the land and the nation with his devils because he knew it was time for God's Son to claim his land and his people. So John went outside of Jerusalem into the wilderness to separate himself from the apostate nation and to call out a remnant of those who would believe. Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 for your reference. Now those who responded to John were baptized for the remission of sins. Water baptism separated them from the generation of vipers who will be purged out of Israel during the wrath to come. Water baptism was also necessary for Israel at that time because under the law, water washing was required for cleansing those who would serve in the priesthood. Now remember, Israel was to be a kingdom of priests, God's channel of blessing to the rest of the world. But they had become unclean. Now here's key point number eight. To reach the world, God first had to cleanse and save Israel. Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the Messiah, the King promised to Israel in the Old Testament. He preached to Israel the gospel of the kingdom. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. This is Mark chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 and Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. As Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 15, that was verse 8. He said very clearly, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew records that in his gospel, chapter 15, that was verse 24. Christ taught that salvation was through him. Those who believed that he was the Son of God, the King of Israel, would receive eternal life in the kingdom. He also taught obedience to the law given to Israel. Christ went to Israel because Israel was to be the channel of blessing to the Gentiles. Christ came to Israel in order to reach the world through Israel's rise to kingdom glory. The Abrahamic covenant, which we just covered, was still in effect. To be blessed, Gentiles had to bless Israel and believe the kingdom gospel. Let's study the two Gentiles who are blessed in the Gospels. The centurion in Luke chapter 7, verse 25, that centurion was blessed because he sent elders of the Jews to Jesus to ask for the healing of his servant. The Jews told Christ he was worthy. And they said, For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. 
The woman of Canaan in Matthew chapter 15 verses 22 through 28 did not receive healing for her daughter until she acknowledged that she understood her place as a Gentile under the Abrahamic covenant. When Christ said to her, It is not meet to take the children's, Israel's, bread and to cast it to dogs, meaning Gentiles, she responded, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Because she said this, Christ responded, Great is thy faith. And Mark chapter 7 verse 28 tells us, For this saying, he healed her daughter. During his earthly ministry, Jesus Christ worked miracles to validate that he was the Messiah, God in the flesh. His miracles gave the people a foretaste of the coming kingdom. The two hallmark signs of the kingdom were casting out devils and healing the sick. These signs fill the Gospels. In Luke chapter 11, verse 20, Christ said, If I with a finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. In casting out devils, he was demonstrating his capacity to bind the strong man, Satan, and spoil his house, the house of Israel. He was demonstrating that he was the one who would rescue Israel from satanic captivity. Read about this in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 24 and 25. When asked, Art thou he that should come? Christ answered by quoting a passage about the kingdom. And this is recorded by Matthew in his account of Jesus' earthly ministry in chapter 11, verse 36. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. Now here's key point number nine. Christ's miracles were a demonstration that he was God in their midst, and the kingdom was indeed at hand. So if the kingdom was at hand, what did Christ teach about the kingdom? Christ's earthly ministry focused on the kingdom promised to Israel in the Old Testament. In what is called the Sermon on the Mount, Christ taught about the nature of this kingdom and those who will enter it. He exalted the law, because once the kingdom is established, the law will be magnified and enforced on earth. This is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 48. The law will be written in redeemed Israel's hearts, and God says, He will cause you, Israel, to walk in my statutes. Jesus Christ also said, The meek shall inherit the earth. He taught Israel to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. In the parables, he taught about different aspects of the kingdom. For example, in the parable in Luke chapter 19, verses 12 to 27, he taught that a nobleman, Jesus Christ, went to a far country, heaven, to receive for himself a kingdom and a return. Upon his return, those who were faithful were given cities in the kingdom to rule over, as the faithful in Israel will be given in the real kingdom. In the parable of the householder in his vineyard, Christ reveals that the kingdom will be taken from the apostate religious leaders of Israel and given to a nation, singular, not plural, but a nation, singular. It is the believing remnant in Israel, the little flock and it will bring forth the fruits thereof. Luke records what Christ told his disciples about this in chapter 12, verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Note how Isaiah chapter 5, verse 17 explains this parable. Israel is the vineyard of God. But even though the kingdom was at hand, the fulfillment of certain Old Testament prophecies had to happen first. And so Christ prepares Israel for the tribulation prior to the kingdom. For example, he told them that when they see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, they must flee to the mountains. This is in Matthew 24. He told them to take no thought for what they shall eat or drink, 
because God will take care of them. Matthew 6, verse 31. He told them to sell all that they had. Luke chapter 12, verse 33. And the believers continue to do that in Acts chapter 2. All these instructions were given because during the tribulation they will have to flee from the Antichrist. In the mountains God will provide miraculously for them, just as he did for their fathers in the wilderness, with daily manna and quail, and for Elijah when he fled from King Ahab. That's why Christ told them to pray, Give us this day our daily bread. The so-called Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Now Christ further taught that after the tribulation he would come with his angels to gather his elect, the believers of Israel, into their land. Additionally, Matthew chapter 13 verses 41 and 42 says, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Now note that those who are taken are taken to judgment, not to heaven. Those who are left are left to inherit the kingdom, which will be established on earth. Now, speaking of his second coming, Luke chapter 17, verses 34 through 37, provides some wonderful details. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in bed. One shall be taken, the other shall be left. Taken to judgment and left to enter the kingdom. In verse 35, Luke continues, Two women shall be grinding together. One shall be taken, the other left. Two men shall be in the field, but one shall be taken, the other left. And they answered him and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. In preparation for the kingdom, Christ chose twelve apostles. In Matthew chapter 19, 28, he told them, When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory... Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. They were to be his cabinet, so to speak. He sent these twelve to preach to Israel only. And once again, Matthew records Christ's instructions to his apostles. In chapter 10, starting at verse 5, he says, These twelve Jesus sent forth, and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He gave them the signs of the kingdom. Now listen as Matthew continues Christ's instructions in verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received freely give. Note that the gospel of the kingdom preached by Christ and his apostles is not the gospel we preach today. For one thing, those who believed the gospel were promised eternal life in the kingdom God will establish on the earth, not eternal life in heaven. In addition, when the apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom, they did not preach the cross, which is central to the gospel today. They did not yet understand that Christ would have to die and be raised. In fact, late in their ministry, when Christ began to tell them of his coming death, Peter responded by saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Additionally, the scriptures are careful to tell us the following. They understood none of these things, and this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. You'll find that in Luke chapter 18, verse 34. Please carefully compare Luke chapter 9, verse 16 with Luke chapter 18, verses 32 and 34, and Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 to 8, with Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 22. This all brings us to key point number 10 now. These passages make it clear 
that the apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom with power and signs to validate their message. Yet they understood nothing about the cross. So how did the nation of Israel respond to her king, the Messiah? The leaders of Israel under Satan's influence rejected Christ and called for his crucifixion. Jesus Christ went willingly, trusting the will of the Father. God raised him from the dead after three days, and that was the fulfillment of Israel's feast of Passover and the feast of firstfruits. The risen Christ then appeared to the apostles and gave them the Holy Ghost so that they would have the authority and understanding to carry on his ministry after his ascension. Read about this in John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23. In Luke chapter 24, verse 45, he says that Christ opened their understanding. Acts chapter 1, verse 3 says that he spent 40 days with them, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So, in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the apostles asked, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? He told them that it was not for them to know the times but that they shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. These areas comprise the land area promised to Israel. And then to the uttermost parts of the earth, he said. Now this statement by Christ has been called the Great Commission by many. I'll be looking into that in some detail very shortly. We will also learn that this is Israel's commission to fulfill elements of the Abrahamic Covenant, it is not our commission. But Christ had told them that they would not have gone over all of the cities of Israel before he would return. This is Matthew chapter 10, verse 23. This is because under the prophesied plan, Israel as a nation had to be cleansed during the tribulation. Then Christ would come and send redeemed Israel out to the Gentiles. So the apostles remained in Jerusalem throughout the early Acts period preaching to the Jews and proselytes, calling on them to repent. Israel's prophetic program is nearing a crisis point, and that nation's last chance to repent of their serious mistake in having rejected their Messiah. So here's where we are now. With Israel and her program, Christ the Messiah has been crucified, buried, and after three days raised from the dead, all according to prophecy. He has spent 40 days teaching his apostles everything about himself that was in the scriptures. Now the believing remnant, the little flock, waits for the promise of receiving the power of the Holy Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost, and that's only 10 days away. After that, the believing remnant knows that they will face the period of God's wrath, which we refer to as the Great Tribulation. Well, this concludes part one of this presentation, and we will discover how Israel responds 